Hi everybody, this is Just Some Guy. I decided to try something new here. I thought I'd review some books from specific publishers. It's always interesting to see what companies publish. Lately, some publishers have taken a very political angle to the books they put out. It gives the company itself a political tone to the point that if you see their logo on a book, you pretty much know what the book will be about. And what better publisher to do this with than Black Mask? You might know them. They're the folks behind The Black Comic and Kim and Kim. Those two series were shit, but Black Mask publishes almost two dozen books. I figured I'd buy the first issue of all those titles and review them. Basic probability says at least one of them has to be good. Unfortunately, Beautiful Canvas isn't one of them. Where do we begin? Let's start with what Black Mask says on its site about Beautiful Canvas. Quote, Lon Isley is a hit woman hired to kill a small child a few days after discovering her girlfriend is pregnant. In a bold declaration of uncertainty, she saves the boy and hits the road, despite the fact that her boss clearly wanted him dead for a reason. This warped crime dystopia delves into the emotional dichotomy of creator-slash-destroyer, as Lon tries to connect the two very different worlds she now inhabits. From Sammy Cavella and Ryan K. Lindsay comes a gonzo tale of personal discovery, animal-slash-hybrid hit troops, and reactive pyrokinesis. Yeah... As always, let's start with the art. I want to be fair, so let me admit that I'm not personally a fan of this type of style. It just doesn't do anything for me. Sammy Cavella seems like a capable artist though. There's clearly some technical skill there. I just found the posing very stiff on the characters. Felt very staged, and I guess that's because of the art style. It's just not quite photorealistic style that's been popular for a while. It's just not kinetic enough for me. It slows the pacing down because I personally find the art bland and basic. It gets the job done though, but there's not a lot of character to it. If you want to see a better take on this art style, check out Tess Fowler's work. She's stone cold fuck nuts, but she can draw. That's not to say that Cavella doesn't have moments. The opening page is really cool. It's just that nothing else in the first issue lives up to that. The real problem with this book though, is the plot and the story. Like the synopsis said, Lon is a hit woman. Specifically, she's a hit woman with a guilty conscience. The first guy we see is from a hit she did a while ago. She has these flashbacks as she talks to people. The flashbacks go back to what I guess are hits she regrets doing. It's not really clear, and that's true with a lot of the stuff in the book. We see that Lon is talking with the billionaire psychopath Mila Albuquerque. If that's her name, I'm guessing it's silly on purpose. And when I say Mila is a psychopath, I'm not kidding. This crazy bitch cuts off guys' body parts and plants them and calls it art. She's totally unhinged and she thinks she owns people. She wants Lon to take out someone for her, so Lon goes to do the job. So far, the setup isn't too bad. We do get the usual drug talk that's really popular with progressives. I think they think they're being edgy, but they should stop being edgy in the 90s. Having characters constantly talk about doing drugs is something a high school student who just watched Pulp Fiction would do. But Ryan K. Lindsay can't help himself. The lady Lon is supposed to kill opens with this line. I will literally snap off your dick, you piece of shit. Oh, it gets worse. So the lady named Julie follows that classy line with this. Don't you goose me with this shit, Paul. I told you what I wanted. Now go get it for me before I drive over there and shove my surprisingly large boot through your insanely tight asshole. Shouldn't it be up your asshole? Really, who talks like this? Who writes like this? It's just silly, but let's just get through the scene. She says, You'll get it for me, or I'll replace you with a younger model who can rattle my molars. Wait, are you threatening to ditch him for a guy who can make you gag? That's the threat. Do what I want, or I'll get someone else to throat fuck me. Right, okay, but that's not the one. This is the one. Jesus, was a time guys trip over their dicks just to cloak my scarf. Look, I know I'm old and not cool, but I usually keep up with the current slang. What the fuck does cloak my scarf even mean? Is this millennial speak for giving head? Did saying giving head go out of style? See, when you try to be clever, you're not clever. Now, I will give Lindsay some credit. I've never seen anybody do coke off a carrot before. Probably because it'd fall off the moment you lifted the carrot, but whatever. So Lon walks in and Julie throws a carrot at Lon, like that would work, and Lon kills her. In walks Julie's little boy, Alex, And he's like, she's dead. Then he hugs Lon and says, thank you. Now, the way I read this is that the boy set up the hit. But no, it was actually Mila. 
The target wasn't the mob. The target was Alex. Mila wanted him dead for her psycho art fetish. I think. I'm not really sure because nothing is very clear in this first issue. Like the follow-up scene. It's two guys on the Ferris wheel. One guy, Eric, seems to be an ex-hitman who's been locked down and tracked by this guy named Keeley. Somehow he finds out that he's being tracked, shows this to Keeley, kills him, and then sets out to get revenge on Mila. For some reason, not explained at all. Are you confused? Don't worry, it gets more confusing. Salon ends up at a diner and pretend calls her girlfriend several times on a rotary phone in 2017. Where the fuck did you find the rotary phone? You have to be over 30 to even know what it is. How does she even know how it works? Honestly, anybody with kids, if you have an old rotary phone, give it to them. They won't know what to do. They'll be pressing it and pressing it. Plug it in. I bet they won't even know what a dial tone is. Anyway, Lon calls her girlfriend Asia because of course she's gay. This is a book written by a progressive. Progressive writers always make female leads lesbians for some reason. I'm pretty sure at least a third of the reported lesbians are just fictional characters. Kudos though to Lindsay for not making it a big deal. It's just a thing that Lon has to do. That's the way that gay characters should be written. Don't make an issue out of it. Treat it like you would any straight relationship, then move on with your story. So then we get a scene with crazy ass Mila watering a bloody hand from a guy she's torturing just because. There's really nothing to the scene other than telling the reader that Mila likes to put hits on people and have some guy go and film the dead bodies for a collection. I do want to pause just on this one line though. She says, quote, the world is a funny place. Art, love, fruit, sex, revenge, beauty. They all require exact preparation for far longer than a single apex moment when they become what you wanted them to be. It's all worth it for that singular point of space time. And I consider myself a patient woman. But can you please tell me where the fuck Moore is and what is his sit rep? Dear God, read your dialogue out loud. It's easy. Just look at the page and make your mouth make the sounds you see. George Lucas is like, Jesus Christ, where's my red pen? This pretentious bullshit is just not working. You've got an editor on a book. Did you listen to him? Or did he just sign off on whatever you wrote? Star Trek babble makes more sense than this shit. This is such a mess. Such a fucking mess. I have no idea what the hell is going on in this book at this point. Why did Mila call for the hit? Meh. Why did Lon take the boy? Who knows. Who's that jackass on the Ferris wheel? Just some guy. I didn't even know I was in the book. It's just the most confusing shit ever. And then this happens. I swear to God, this is from the same book. I swear to God, it's the same book. One page we're watching Mila torture somebody. The next you've got fake killer croc, crab lady, Mr. Beekman, chitlin legs, and hentai dream girl. What does this have to do with anything we've seen in this book so far. Where did anyone even mention there were monsters or mutants or whatever these people are? Where did anyone say these types of folks existed? They literally come out of nowhere and of course they swear like madness. You know when I was in college I noticed in my fiction writing classes that lots of students would have tons of cussing in their stories. Like a ridiculous level of it. It's the kind of thing that young people do once they're officially adults. They swear like crazy because now nobody can tell them to stop, and young writers think that this makes their work sound more mature and edgy. It doesn't. It just makes you a shit writer. You're not Quentin Tarantino. If you're going to have your character swear, know how to use it. Don't just have a cuss show. It's lazy and childish, and it actually takes away from any seriousness you were trying to build. Anyway, the bait bus crew tracks down Lon thanks to a tip from a lady at the restaurant. They go to kill her, but she kills them. Off panel. Because why would you want to see what looks like a normal human murder a bunch of monsters? What's the fun in that? Somehow Lon takes out everyone. And this is when we learn, in the vaguest way possible, that Asia, Lon's girlfriend, is pregnant. She says that she's about to start a family with Lon. Now, the last time I checked, all the clam slapping in the world ain't gonna get you pregnant. So where'd the baby come from? Unless... Lon isn't actually a woman. Maybe Lon is transgender and kept good old Mr. Kamish. I don't know, because it's not in the story. I don't know what the fuck is going on. 
And just to keep it confusing, now the boy Alex has superpowers and he may have been the one who killed the Scooby Gang villains. Okay, what did I just read? This book started with a good premise. It's been done before, but where it was going was kind of interesting. What if this hit woman decided she was done and instead of killing the boy like she was supposed to, she killed his mom and took the kid to start a new life? What if the person who set up the hit wanted revenge on Lon for changing the plans? That seemed to be where this was going. Then the anime porn crew showed up and now I'm completely lost. So this is three series from Black Mask where it seems like nobody stepped in and said to the creator, this doesn't work. Let's see if we can fix it. I get being true to the creator and letting them tell their story, but this book reads like a treatment written out in comic book form. It's a bunch of random ideas thrown together with no focus. And it's like the thing the story wants to do, tells this drama of a hit woman suffering from guilt and wanting to build a family, the writer just did not want to let happen. Dude, the story knows where it wants to go. When you start changing shit and it doesn't work, that's your clue to just let the story tell itself. I'm a big believer in that. When I write stuff and I try to force it to go in a different direction and it becomes a mess, that's because that's not what the story is really about. I need to dial it back to where it worked and let the story and characters guide me in the right direction. All that said, this is way more competent than Black or Kim and Kim. The story and the plot at least started off making sense. <sighs> Jesus Christ. Well, that's three down. We've got 15 more to go. One of them's gotta be good. But what do I know? I'm just some guy.